recording. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wham! Theater Spotlight Series. I'm Kristen Vangenhoven, she, her, the producing artistic director of Wham! Theater. And in this series, Wham! is inviting audiences into conversations with some of this season's groundbreaking theater artists to learn about their process and how their work intersects with activism. Today, I'll be talking with actors Candace Burke and Eileen Schuyler, who are about to appear in our August 7th Fresh Takes reading of Escaped Alone at 3 p.m. at the Mount in Lenox, Massachusetts. Written by iconic feminist playwright Carol Churchill, Escaped Alone brings us to the backyard where three old friends and a neighbor spend a series of summer afternoons chatting while visions of apocalyptic horror play out inside their minds. The four women that Carol Churchill brings to the stage are all in their 70s, which is considered a radical act in the theater. So we wanted to invite Candace and Eileen, two of the four actors who will appear in the reading, here to talk about this radical notion of putting older and experienced women actors on stage in a narrative that doesn't relegate them to characters that are not fully developed or are not pivotal to the play, where their own stories or experiences don't really matter, but rather are adjacent to the male characters. We wanted to hear them talk and share stories about working in the theater, how that has changed over the course of their career and lessons they have learned along the way. Before we begin this juicy conversation, I'd like to acknowledge with gratitude and humility that Wham Theater is based on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Please check out the land acknowledgement page on our Wham Theater website and join us in some of the action steps that we are taking. So the first question I'd love to ask both of you, and maybe we'll start with Eileen and then we'll go to Candice is, can you let our audience know how long you've worked in the theater and what your first big break or your first job was? All right. Well, I've been working in the theater since I was in ninth grade, which would have been about 1964 or something like that. My sister used to say that I was a great person before Brigadoon, but after Brigadoon, <laughs> I was impossible forever. Anyway, I worked and stumbled along. And then I'm, I would say that my first real professional job was at the New York State Theater Institute, which would have been about 1976. And I was in the original company of 16 teacher artists, we were called. And we just did show after show after show. And we traveled around the state. And, and we traveled to Italy. And we traveled to Israel. And we just built one show after another. And that was an enormous learning experience. I worked there for three years and then moved on to New York. And um, so I would say that was my beginning. Oh, and that wow. was a long time ago. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Candace. Well, um, I, I, you know, it, it was funny. I tried to figure this question out because I can't remember a time when I haven't been a storyteller. Um, the first play I did was Peter Pan in third grade, right? And, and that's where I went, oh, this is for me. I like this. And I had a wonderful drama teacher in Des Moines, Iowa named Silpha Snook. And Miss Snook made me, and certainly everybody else, who worked with her believed that anything we wanted to do was possible. So, so it's been going on a long time. I'm 78 now. I took, I took some time out in the middle. So it hasn't been a direct line. Um, I took several years out to be the director of the Children's Museum in LA. And then I took some time out to design a, a museum about world mythology. And um, uh, maybe 10 years ago, I went back to school. I thought that might be a good idea um, and took a degree from, um, from the med school at the University of Minnesota uh, in integrative medicine. So 
while I've been working at this for probably 65 years, I've, it's not a direct line. I've mm -hmm. taken some time to do other things. Uh, thank you. Well, we just did a whole benefit evening about being miscast. And during that evening, at least one of the performers spoke about getting always getting cast as older than she actually was. <laughs> I'm wondering if you've ever been cast as younger than you actually are, or if you resonate with getting cast as older than you were or are. Um, mm -hmm. Candice, does that resonate with you at all? Sure. Um, well, it, I will say at 78, I'm pretty much always cast as somebody younger at this point. But I just did this wonderful piece in Chester uh, that was a, an adaptation of Pride and Prejudice where we played several characters. So I played somebody who was 27 and somebody who was in her 40s. Um, I played the nurse in Romeo and Juliet when I was 27, way too young, but I played her again at the Guthrie when I was 70, way too old. Right. But you make it work, you know? What about it, you, Eileen? Did you ever have well, an experience? I started, I mean, when I was in high school, I was playing Amanda Wingfield and the, <laughs> the child. I was always what you'd call a character actor, yeah. which means the old, the parent, the old one, whatever. I did play some age appropriate roles, but usually get cast older. And um, I played one of the most wonderful experiences was playing um, Vera in 4,000 Miles and she's 91. And um, she was so familiar to me, everything about her. She was my, my family, very, very interesting, rich, beautiful, funny, touching, wonderful play. And um, so they wanted to cast people who were in their 70s for that because they just, it's too grueling for somebody who is really the actual age. And so I spent the rehearsal really learning physically how to be 91. And that was a really great experience. But usually I'm cast as the older type character. And I just wanna add that I worked for nine seasons at Stageworks Hudson and they had this, what was called play by play and they were short plays and they would have a cast of four, two, people, male and female, to play the older characters and two to play the younger characters. And about age 50, I would say I aged out because I couldn't, they didn't, couldn't accept me as much younger than I was. And wow. people don't write older characters very much, which mm -hmm. is something we'll talk about after, but um, yeah. so usually older or what you would call character parts at any age. <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, why don't we skip to that? Because that's a beautiful segue. Why do you think, Eileen, that playwrights aren't sharing the stories of older women? It's certainly not the same for older men. Well, yes, that's absolutely true. I think, um, I, as I said to you earlier, that, you know, when women pass what the hotness phase, they're supposed to have the good manners to disappear. And I think that older women are invisible in our whole society. Mm -hmm. I don't think that People are interested in learning about them, hearing about them. You know, postmenopausal women are really basically not that interesting to them. I, I, I will anecdotally say that I have been a, a reader for the Next Act New Play Festival at Capital Rep since its inception. And I read the first 15 pages of maybe 60 or 70 plays every single time. And the number of plays that have a character that's a female, that's older, I mean, some years there are none. Some years there might be one. And almost never. Uh, I, I just think especially younger playwrights are just not interested in our stories. We're supposed to, we can be the hag, we can be the cranky neighbor, we can be the dysfunctional mother who rails and sits in a wheelchair. And what, but regular rich characters just I don't think they think they are rich and interesting wow when yeah. it's in general that's just my yeah. anecdotal experience and I think in Britain it's a little different oh okay and Candace you know obviously I think it's the complete opposite I've always been very interested in the stories you know of women who are older but Candace does it resonate what you're hearing from Eileen or is there anything you want to add to that no, absolutely it does and I think I think it it is. Um, I mean, I th I think we ha we have to address it in terms of of um, 
you know, there is a, this patriarchal society. And if we look at our mythology or at our religious, I mean, we are inundated from the time we are tiny people to understand that, as you say, Eileen, uh, we, as we get older, should go over here, right? Um, and it just strikes me, that question struck me. I thought, well, okay, so how do, we, how do we begin to change that up? I think certainly Carol Churchill has done it, but I think part of it is that there are many more older women now who are interesting. Right. When my mother was this age, well, when my mother was this age, she was dead. But but there are um, there are many more older, interesting women now in our society. And I think we have to tell our stories. Right. Um, yeah. And I wonder in novels, but not so much in plays. Oh, that's interesting. And I wonder if we're starting to just all um, take up more space, right? It's like there's, we have the silent generation yep. where we were meant to be quiet and, you know, don't speak unless you're spoken to. Um, although now we have our youth who are really confident and in, in taking up space. We have at, in, at WAM, we started a few years ago, our elder ensemble, and we really struggled with the name, like what should we call it? We knew it was going to be women 65 plus community members who wanted to um, explore, you know, being an elder woman and using a intersectional feminist lens and sharing their stories. And um, it's been such a beautiful community of women. Um, hopefully some of whom are going to come to see Escaped Alone as well. And again, like just so many interesting stories, you know, and one summer we had them work in collaboration with our teen ensemble. It was absolutely fascinating because you had these um, young people who really don't identify with the American dream idea anymore. And yeah. the older people trying to um, like being sort of wowed by the confidence and ambitions and of these younger people who are like, I'm going to go out and do this and I'm going to go out and do this and just a very different entryway into life. And they were really learning from one another. You know, the young people were learning about the experiences of yeah. these elders and, and, and vice versa. It was a beautiful collaboration. Um, where they all envisioned what a future could look like, but it was really clear, like how different after standing on the shoulders of these past generations, what that has led to in terms of taking up space. Cause I would argue there's always been so many interesting women's stories. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. We all have such interesting stories and they've just been lost to history. And, and as we're hearing, like they're still not being shared. So I'm wondering, you know, we talked a little bit about like how women are cast, in particular, how older women are cast. You touched on it, Eileen. And I'm wondering, um, I'd love to hear about what are the roles you're getting asked to play or are you not getting asked to play any roles, you know, and what are the roles you would love to play? Like you would love to be asked to play the types well, of roles. I'm not really getting asked to play anything. So um, I just feel like, you know, the they move on they've moved on and um i i think it's there just isn't much if you get like the actors breakdown i used to get it for a while in backstage magazine and, and in a newspaper and you know for, uh, you know what there was casting and there was nothing nothing you know you would go day after day after day and there really isn't anything and the, if they're going to be one juicy older role they're going to give it to somebody that is known or you know a veteran of that theater I would love to, I've always wanted to play um, the character, and I don't even remember her name anymore, in uh, Collected Stories. And I don't know if Donald Margulies is mm -hmm. I think, brilliant. And that woman is a woman with experience and life and talent and energy and the younger person whom she befriends, you know, rises up and takes her place and steals her story. And it's a real, yeah, it's a real, she literally steals her story. Um, and I've, that's, that's one that, that's one of the ones that I've always wanted to play. Wow. Oh, thank you for that. What about you, Candace? How do you feel you're getting cast? And um, I, well, I, I've been fortunate that, that, um, especially in moving here that I've, been asked to do some things. They've um, they've been challenges in that they are not age specific. I think some of that is is 
um, true. I think Escaped Alone has been the age specific piece that I that I look forward to. Um, but I think I in terms of things I'd like to play um, or like to do, I theater is such an ensemble art. I'm 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 feeling as I'm getting older and it's harder to learn lines. It's harder to um, crank up the necessary energy I'm I'm finding. Um, and maybe I want to do some other pieces of this or maybe I want to do some writing or some directing or you know so I'm not I'm not terribly concerned right now about about um doing more than I'm being asked to do uh, if I could play anything I would love to do a new adaptation a stage adaptation of Harold and Maude I would love yeah wouldn't that be fun oh, yeah I would I'm particularly interested in relationships between um people my age and younger people. I would love to take on Prospero um, and see what what's that story if Prospero is a mother instead of a father. Um, that kind of stuff. I'd like to play, you know, I'd like to play a little bit. Yes, yes, that's so juicy. Those all sound wonderful. Lots of ideas for all the <laughs> Um, you, we've probably got about five minutes left or so. So I would love to hear from both of you. You know, you've had this extraordinary experience of having multiple decades working professionally in the theater. And I'm so curious, like, how has working in the theater changed since you started your acting career? Can you identify ways in which it has changed from the beginning or in the middle or now? Are there any kind of turning points that you remember? Maybe Eileen, have you got something? Hmm. Or Candace, whichever one of you thinks you've got something to offer. Hey, Candace, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure because when you're in a different place in your career, the theater looks different to you. It's yeah. not reachable. I will say that Actors' Equity has changed. And when I lived in New York, um, I couldn't, I, I was in my mid thirties and I couldn't, I couldn't get arrested because you couldn't, I wasn't in equity and you couldn't at that time, you couldn't go to an audition for an equity role unless you were already equity. But if you weren't able to go to the audition, then you couldn't get an equity card. And it was a sort of catch 22. And they've changed that. They have opened up to enable you to audition for equity work. And I know that there's a lot of reasons for them to do that, but I think that's helpful because um, there were so many things when I was younger that I know I could have done. And I was just not, I was not allowed. I'd go anyway to try to come at the end, at the end of a call and I would get pushed aside or insulted or shoved away. And so I think that that's changed. And I also think that uh, video submissions and mm -hmm. the way that affects things, because I think film and stage are very different. And I don't know that it tells necessarily the stories in the same way. And so I think that that, you know, that's a COVID thing and it's wonderful because people can participate from all different places, but it has changed stage work in that way. Yeah. So those are two things that I could say. Mm, yeah. I, I, Jesse Green has written a couple of wonderful pieces for the Times about pay equity and about, um, what did he call them? Like um, sacred monsters, getting rid of uh, sort of the that notion that you had to be uh, it, it was fine to be abusive. It was fine to be demanding if you were a great talent. Um, and that that's moving, that seems to be, you know, not being tolerated as much anymore. My very first teaching job in a theater department, um, I was teaching with my husband, um, who is also an actor, Ray Burke. And, um, I was told by the dean that I really didn't need to get paid because he was being paid and he was clearly the head of the household. Um, and, and yeah, yeah, and this was at Southern Methodist University. I mean, it was a significant university theater program. They ended up paying me half of his salary, but, and so that would never happen now. 
right? Those kinds of things. I think we've come a we've come a long way. Um, yeah. Although I will say, women still don't get paid at the same level, right? But they at right. least are getting getting paid. So you both alluded to you alluded, Candace, to being in L.A. in your 40s and that that wasn't happening. And you alluded to being in New York in your 30s and like, you know, you couldn't get seen. Is there anything either one of you want to share about those experiences of like the struggle you had it in your 30s or 40s of just sort of not oh. able to get a hold? Well, I. I just mm. found that it could, I, first of all, I was sort of a, as I say, character actor. And if you're gonna be a character actor in New York, you have to be the specific age of and yeah. type of the person. So I had played, if you looked at my resume, it was all of these middle-aged women, older characters. And they said, well, you don't put any of that down on your resume because they're not gonna cast you that way. But then the young ones mm. that want this gorgeous, sylph-like, you know, you know, I went to a, a an audition for, um, you know, a commercial and they said, well, this is for food. And we never cast anybody that looks like they eat any food. Um, you know, so I, I was sort of, in, you know, I was in the middle somewhere and there just didn't seem to be any space. But if I were to give myself advice um, now, I would say be braver. Uh try harder call more people try to hook up with you know a a, a director a, a, a an agent or someone who can who can do that selling part for you instead of just selling yourself I was just too timid and you know I still am oh that's interesting. But in New York it's easier to be timid yeah. because they're just yeah. such a pile up of yeah. of, of people and um yeah. but that being a character actor when you're kind of they consider too young um, was a problem for me. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Candace? You know, I, I'm not even sure why I've thought of this, but I think someplace along the line in LA, one, I, our son was young and I was perfectly happy to be, um, to be working at something where I could include him. So being with the Children's Museum was um, actually kind of exciting and I liked it and I didn't miss I didn't really miss not doing uh, this other thing because I liked doing that. I liked the museum world, but and I and I love children. But somewhere along there, I found a Mary Oliver poem that I still. I mean, I it's written on a plaque in my in my office. It um, that that is pay attention be astonished, tell about it. Mm. That's the poem. Mm. And, and that gave me great, um, and still does, great energy um, to, to know that if you pay attention, if you don't get you know, bitter or angry, you, you stay astonished and curious and you find ways to tell about it, whether it's, you know, whether it's this interview or it's uh, doing a production or writing something or what, that seems useful and helpful. Agreed, agreed. Well, you both have kind of answered the next question already about lessons you've learned along the way. <laughs> I mean, you talked about bravery and courage. Bravery. Yeah. You know, and Candace, you talked about curiosity and sharing your story and astonishment. So I'm just as a last question, is there anything I didn't ask that you would like to have make sure that our listeners hear? Hmm. Come see the show. It's a fascinating piece. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. I, I remember we, you know, we 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 did another reading of it at a very hot day, and I just couldn't. I I I I was sort of swimming through it. Like, what is this? What is this? That is so interesting. But then when we were all together reading it, it suddenly was clear. And I think that um, people will enjoy it. I think that they will. Uh, and I think that these four interesting characters are worth watching. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I agree. And our four interesting actors, including the two of you and Joan Coombs and Tamir are certainly also worth watching. Um, well, thank you for that. We're about halfway sold out for the reading. So there's definitely wow. still some room left, but hopefully folks will book soon. 
Thank you both so much for sharing your time today. I wish that we could talk to you for so much more time, but I'm thrilled that I get to be in rehearsal with you um, and present this reading of Escaped Alone by Carol Churchill on Sunday, August 7th at 2 p.m. at the Mount in Lenox. And you can find out more on our website at whamtheater.com. Candice, Eileen, thank you so much for all your service in the theater and for spending your time here with us today. I can't wait to rehearse with you. It Thank was a you so much. <laughs>